So good morning and welcome. So almost exactly a year ago, on uh, November 14th of last year, I submitted a vulnerability to um, uh, a company that had a crypto wallet. They had embedded uh, some user credentials in their mobile application. And with this, an attacker will be able to log in into a third party service and um, query their database. Uh, and anyone who did download, download this application could just reuse these credentials and log in as them. Uh, they awarded, uh, I don't know if you can see that, uh, but they awarded like $2,000 for this. And they invited me to their private program where they would uh, pass me their application before we would hit the app store so that I can check them beforehand. Um, and with this, since then, I, I started doing this on a daily basis. I was, I was checking different applications. Uh, there are a bunch, of applica a bunch of companies that provide a public bug bounty where they tell you, okay, here's my mobile application. Please just check it. And if you find something, we're going to pay you money for it. Um, and during this year, I found that many, many apps are, are making the same mistakes over and over. So I found the same vulnerabilities in very different applications. And we're going to talk about four of them. I wish we could talk about more, but it's going to take a long time. Um, and, and this is how the journey started. Uh, so a little disclaimer, all that I talk about here, are, it's my opinion, it's my views, and they do not reflect those of my employer, right? Standard stuff. Uh, to who I am, uh, my name is Ivan Rodriguez. Uh, I'm a software engineer and security researcher. Um, I specialize in mobile applications, uh, and specifically on iOS. Uh, and that is because I was an iOS developer for a long time, and then I moved into security uh, because it was a space that was, uh, it's not crowded, there's not many people doing this, uh, and it was interesting to earn money because of that. Um, I, I do a lot of research around mobile applications, like I said, iOS, and I publish uh, most of my research on my uh, blog, which is ivyforigas.com, uh, so you can check out, uh, there are different topics, there are different um, different researchers that, I, that I've done in the past. So you can check the blog post there. I also tweet a lot about this, uh, so you can find me on Twitter, uh, at the Rodrigo CA. Um, I retweet a lot of accounts that I have to do anything with security on, on mobile applications. Uh, that's for both iOS and Android, uh, but I tweet a lot about that. Uh, and finally, uh, during my version year, I found that there are some steps they can automate, so I, if I feel comfortable with sharing some very bad code. I publish them on GitHub. Uh, you can also check my, uh, my repos over there, and sometimes uh, you can get some scripts that will help you automate some of the things for reverse engineering iOS apps. And today we're going to talk a little bit about reverse engineering the iOS app at a very high level, because that could be a talk on its own. Uh, so at a very high level, how do we decrypt iOS apps and how do we transfer them to our computer? Uh, so we're going to see some tools to do that. Uh, then finally, we're going to see uh, four different vulnerabilities that are very common in, in many, many applications. Uh, and we're going to see some like prevention and techniques and how, how to fix them if you already have them on your application. Uh, and finally, some resources about this. If you're interested in learning more and, and experiencing this by yourself, uh, you can just check them. And hopefully, we get to some questions. OK, so let's start with reverse engineering. Um, so not many people know, but when you download an app from the App Store, that app is encrypted. Uh, so it's not plain text on your phone. And so the first step we have to do is we need to decrypt that iOS app. Uh, and Apple uses a protocol that is called, or an algorithm that is called Fairplay, which was introduced with iTunes. When, back in the day, when iTunes was introduced, you were able to download songs instead of buying CDs. And Apple needed a way to protect uh, the songs so that you will not download them and redistribute them. And so they came up with this uh, algorithm that's called Fairplay, and they used something similar. It's kind of tweaked, but it's similar for the iOS apps. Um, we need a jailbroken phone to do this. That is because uh, most of the tools that we're going to use are not allowed in the App Store. Uh, so uh, also people might not know, but every single process that runs on your iOS device has to be signed by Apple or a developer certificate or an um, enterprise certificate that also go all the way ch to the chain to Apple. Uh, and these tools that, are, that we're using to the crypt iOS apps are not signed by Apple. So that's why you need a jailbroken phone. Uh, and uh, third, we don't really decrypt uh, the, the iOS apps. Uh, we're just going to load it into memory, and we're going to dump a portion of the memory and just going to rewrite the binary. Right? So we're going to ask iOS, look, iOS, you know how to decrypt this app. Just load it into memory, and then we're just going to grab it from memory. 
And lastly, once we have this, we built the iOS app, which is transferred to our computer where we can do further analysis. Uh, so how do we do it? Uh, we can use some tools like dump memory, where it takes a file name, which in this case is the binary app, uh, and then a portion of the, or an offset of memory that we want to dump. And um, the reason is because all the, the, the binaries have a header that indicate what's the portion of the binary that's encrypted. It's not the entire binary that's encrypted. Uh, so with this information, we can ask iOS to load it into memory and then we dump that portion of, of the binary that is encrypted. Um, luckily, we don't have to do this by hand. We don't have to figure out the headers and all of that. There are tools that we can use for this. Uh, these are three of the most common ones. There are many, many more now. Um, at the dump decrypted or BF inject or free to iOS dump, all of them are open sourced and you can check them. Um, they will allow you to target an application and it will launch it for you, it will decrypt it, and then uh, you will end up with a decrypted version of an, uh, an iOS app. So for the non-iOS developers in the room, um, the applications, the iOS applications have a .ipa extension but in reality, they're just zip files. Uh, so what we could do is we could literally just rename that file into that zip and extract all the files that come in with your application. And now this is gonna be very important because sometimes developers don't realize that every file that they'd include into, in their app can be easily accessible by a, a potential attacker. And we're gonna see that. Um, once you're, you have the decrypted version of your app, you can perform two types of analysis, which is um, the dynamic analysis and the static analysis. Uh, most of the people that I know love the dynamic analysis. It's, it's very fun. It's, it's, uh, you're sniffing the traffic of your application. Uh, most of the applications would need a, a server to connect to, to read data or to write data. Um, so this is very fun where you get to see the packets that are going through, you're gonna change some values, you're gonna see oh, how the server reacts, uh, change some values again, and how do the app reacts. So this is a very fun part of the analysis. Um, also, many company, companies are interested into games, for example. They have open bug bounty programs where they would say, look, if you find a vulnerability that a very common currency in game is coins. Like to say, if an attacker can generate thousands of millions of coins, and they can get an unfair advantage of that because of that. Uh, so we're interested to see any of those kinds of vulnerabilities. So this would be part of the dynamic analysis where you literally are playing the game to see how it works and to see if you can circumvent some of the restrictions and you can figure this thing out. Um, but there's also the other side, which is the static analysis. And many people don't like this one because they say it's very boring. And I, I sometimes agree, but I personally love this part. Actually, all the vulnerabilities we're gonna to see today were found using static analysis. I did not even run the app to find them. Um, and then this represents a, that you will have to sit down, you have to read the decrypted version of the app. You see the machine code, you figure out this method is jumping here, this method is doing this. Um, the, the application does X when, when I tap this button, things like that. And you also read through thousands, maybe thousands of, of files that the developer included with the binary. And so you have to go through uh, fonts, you have to go to images, you have to go through um, uh, configuration files, which is very important because sometimes developers don't realize that if they add a configuration file with a hard-coded credential, it's gonna end up in the binary, it's gonna, so it's gonna end up in the bundle, and then an attacker could just extract that. And that's exactly what happened in the first vulnerability we're gonna to see today. Uh, when, you, when you unzip your application, you end up with all of these files. You have folders like the frameworks folder, uh, uh, which hosts all the third party uh, uh, frameworks that you're using in this application. Um, and then it has all the images that you use, all the custom fonts that you use, but especially the configuration file, like .json, so the .plist, the .xml files. They're gonna be there plain, in plain text. So in this case, this is a very common mistake that a lot of people do. They embed a configuration file sometimes with things like a private key. Um, yes, which is intended to be private. As the name suggests, it should be private. So how do we end up in this situation? Uh, what's happening is that a very common pattern is that they're the companies don't have the resources of time, maybe, well, time is a resource, uh, but they don't have the resources to um, build their own backend system, for example, and they, so they hire the services of a third party, let's call it a cloud database, for example. And what this provider is gonna do 
uh, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to give you a certificate with a private key so that you can access your resources in our cloud. And that certificate uh, probably has an uh, um, SSH key, like a private key, to, so that you can establish an SSH connection into the server. The problem is that many developers are embedding their certificate directly in their app and making the API request directly from the app to the third party. Now this is, if you look at it from the user perspective, this, this is not different from connecting to your server or anything. Like it, the app is just connecting to somewhere. But from the attacker's perspective, that means that your certificate is living the same, in the same client that I'm able to see in plain text. And so don't do this. Uh, anyone could have access to this uh, vulnerability or, or this credentials, and this is exactly what the first vulnerability I show you the screenshot for, uh, what they were doing exactly this, um, right? So how do we fix this? What's the proper way to handle this pattern or architecture this system? So yes, we're gonna generate uh, the certificate from the server and we're gonna download that. But we're gonna build a middleware. We're gonna build our own infrastructure, our own server where we actually store the certificate. Um, and then this certificate, this uh, server will expose a public API that our application is going to connect to. Now, this has many, many benefits, uh, and some of them are, so you're going to be able to handle the authentication part on your own. You're going to give them a username and password, and then you're going to return a token or a session ID or something that you know that they are authenticated to use your API. That's number one. Second is that you're not exposing uh, files like the, the private key that your third party uh, cloud service is requiring you to access their, their services. Um, you're gonna do that directly from your server, which is, it doesn't have a front end, uh, or it should not be exposed to the internet, and that's the one that's gonna ho host this private certificate. So this is the way you should do it. This is the way you should build an architecture of the system instead of embedding directly private information into your mobile app. Well, I'm real number two. Uh, so for the non-IOS developers in the room, and for those that jump directly into Swift, this is Objective-C. And to showcase the, uh, the vulnerabilities, I built my own vulnerable app. So my, my own application is vulnerable to all of these vulnerabilities that we're gonna talk about. Uh, first, we need to know that there's an API from iOS that allows an app to be launched from a different process. Uh, for example, a different application. Let's say we have uh, application X, and that application has some sort of feed, and in the feed you find a tweet, a link of a tweet, for example. So when, you, when the user taps on that link, uh, the pop-up is gonna show up and they're gonna say, do you wanna open this in the Twitter app? And most of the users are gonna say yes, because the experience is gonna be way better if you open that link in the Twitter app, because the Twitter app was literally built to show tweets. Uh, so this is a very common pattern, and it's called uh, URL schemes. So you, as an, as an application, you register the URLs that you're supposed to be handling, that you are allowed to handle, that you know how to handle. And the convention is that it's usually the name of the application, column slash slash, and then you can send some arbitrary parameters to the application that you want to launch. In this case, and this is a real world scenario, but where the application was listening to a URL scheme and it will look for the keyword news and then forward slash and then everything that came after that was treated as a valid HTML content. And not only that, after treating it as a valid HTML content, it would load a web view. Uh, for those who don't know a web view, it's essentially a fu fully functional web browser within your native application. Uh, so this app will search for the, uh, the keyword news and then will treat the entire parameters as valid HTML that it will load in a web view within their application, not, not send them to Safari, like load them directly in their application. So what could go wrong with this? Uh, so this is my application, uh, that I named it Coinza. Coin because I was building a, a crypto wallet, uh, funny application, and Za because I love pizza. Um, and so let's imagine that the user is just browsing around. They're, they're just navigating websites, they're just, um, I don't know, Googling something or something. And there's a link, they find a link, and the link say, and Safari says, oh, you wanna open this in your native app. Let's imagine this is your bank app, right? Let's imagine um, you, you're gonna have a rich experience if you open this link in your web app. The problem is that since the HTML is controlled by anyone that is opening this URL, they can pass in whatever HTML content that they want. 
In this case, it's just loading a Wikipedia article, which is fine, it's just to illustrate this. But someone can build or craft a login screen for your bank app, for example. If your bank application is loading arbitrary HTML content within their own app, people are gonna trust that. People are, are, are gonna inherently just say, yes, uh, I'm just gonna enter my username and password again. Because it's your mobile, it is your bank application that it says, oh, sorry, we lost your, your session. Can you please re-log in? Most of the people are gonna do that. And the, the real problem is that this is a fully functional web, view, uh, um, web browser, but we don't necessarily have a navigation bar. So nowadays, uh, many people are aware that there are phishing attacks where they're gonna try to make you enter your username and password in a funny uh, email, web email, for example, but they, they are learning that if the URL looks funny, I'm not gonna enter things. Whereas here, that's not possible because the logo is gonna be your bank application, it's gonna be your crypto wallet, it's gonna be whatever native app that you're launching. And then people are gonna inherently just trust that and just gonna enter the username and password again. So uh, to illustrate this, uh, this is the way um, uh, URL schemes work where you establish the name of the application, in this case coinsa, column slash slash, news, and then some, some HTML parameters. In this case, it was just very simple. We just changed the, the, the current web page to a Wikipedia article. But again, as we said before, uh, it could be something more dangerous. Uh, and you have to encode the URL so that it was parsable when it's passed to a different application. Right? So how do we fix this? First, never, ever, ever trust arbitrary code that you don't own or that you're not generating. Uh, if someone else can send you this information, if someone else can send you parameters, don't just trust them. Don't, never load them into something that a user can interact with. Right? Uh, so URL schemes and web views are a very dangerous combination and you should be careful when you're using them. Just make sure that the content that you're loading, it's trusted, that you know that it's executing the right things. Uh, never load arbitrary code that you don't know where it's coming from. And lastly, if you need to react to dynamic um, actions from uh, like a URL scheme passing parameters, just maybe have a white list of actions that you're allowed to take. And then if, if the content or the parameters that you're getting doesn't align with any of those, you're just gonna say, sorry, I'm not gonna load this thing, right? Number three, um, so this vulnerability, it's not specifically for third-party applications, but it's, uh, it's, it's shown here because one of, one of the very, uh, one of the most popular uh, third-party uh, libraries for accessing the network uh, was vulnerable to this. So what's happening? Um, when you build a browser, the browser has to open any website. Like it has, you don't know which website the user wants to open. But when you build an app, you probably know which services this app is gonna connect to. You know probably just one server, uh, or at least a handful of servers that you're gonna connect to. So you know the URLs that, it's, that are expected to be uh, queried from your application. So what many people do, uh, and I suggest you to do it, because it's a very uh, good approach, or get a feature to have, um, they're, they're gonna do what it's called, like, it, people call it S, S, SSL pinning, certificate pinning, or public key pinning. There's actually a, a huge difference between pinning the certificate or the public key info. Uh, but anyways, the, the, the core idea is that you know the website that your application is supposed to connect to. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get the same TLS certificate that your server has, and you're gonna embed that with your app. And then when your app tries to connect to the server, it's gonna say, okay, server, send me your, your certificate. And you're gonna check that information against the information that you have in BEP. If it's not the same, I'm not gonna talk to the server. That's it, plain and simple. All right, so when we request, we ask for the certificate. And if it's the same one that we have, we establish a connection. Uh, if you have someone in between that is gonna try to a fake uh, certificate, they're gonna make a, a fake certificate for the website that we're trying to connect to, ideally, this mechanism should stop that request, should not allow any other certificate than the one that we have. The real problem is that when there, in this case, the third party library was vulnerable to this, or when you build this logic and you don't do it correctly, you open the door, excuse me, to someone giving you a fake certificate and you accepting it. 
some of the main reasons I've seen this is, and I've seen this in at least six different applications where developers start building this feature and they are like, oh, we're gonna do this later in the next cycle. So they just have a to-do within the, the, the method that's supposed to handle the certificate checks. And then what that does is that just gonna return true to all of them and it's just gonna accept any certificate they're gonna send. And with that, an attacker, which is, uh, the, the attack is called a metanimator attack, um, is gonna be able to sniff all your traffic between the, your application and your server. And it's not just the URL that you're connecting to, it's all the data, the username and password, your bank application, so your bank information, your health information. Everything that is between you and the server that you're trying to connect is gonna be able to be sniffed. Uh, to illustrate this, for example, I'm gonna use a tool that is called BetterCap. What BetterCup is gonna do is, is, is gonna ask me for an IP that we're gonna call target, and we're gonna launch it and we're gonna ask to sniff for HTTP uh, traffic. And uh, something that is important to see, to see here is that this is a remote attack. I don't have physical access to the device. All I have is the device IP. So let's imagine that there's an attacker in a public coffee house, for example, and they know the IP, so somehow they, they, they manage to get the IPs of, uh, of the users uh, that are on their phones. If your application is vulnerable to this uh, specific issue, uh, what BetterCap is gonna do is gonna start listening to all the packets that your application or your phone is sending. And if one of them is from your vulnerable app, your app is gonna say, okay, I need to request this, this URL. Can you send me this, the TLS certificate for this URL? And then the beauty of the internet is that whoever responds faster, that's the packet that I'm gonna process. And so since I'm, so the, the attacker is probably closer to you than the server is gonna respond faster. So your phone is gonna get that packet before the, the actual server. And so in this case, it's gonna have a fake certificate for the URL they're trying to connect to. And since we're vulnerable to this issue where we accept any certificate, uh, they are gonna be able to sniff our traffic. So it might be a little bit difficult to read, but have a zoom in version here. So what's happening here is that uh, my application, just to mimic uh, some traffic, I'm gonna ask for some content from uh, Google, use, uh, sorry, uh, GitHub uh, user account, usercontent.com, and uh, BetterCap is gonna see that request. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna create a fake version of a TLS certificate for this website, for this URL. You're gonna serve that to see if your application accepts it. The problem is that this application is vulnerable to this, and it's gonna accept that certificate. And now, BetterCap is able to see the request that, I, that I'm making, which in this case is just a static file. But it could be anything, yeah, like real data that your application is sending. So how do we fix this vulnerability? Uh, keep your third party libraries up to date. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, almost every app that I've checked has at least one dependency that is outdated. And being a developer, I know it's a, it's a huge headache to update this thing. Sometimes they break your app. And uh, the, like most of the PMs would say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, just leave it as it is. So that's why many of the third party libraries that, that are in mobile applications are very outdated. Like I'm talking about two, three, four, five, and even six years uh, outdated. And this could lead to potential uh, vulnerabilities like these. Uh, and, and also I, I understand that it's hard to manage because some applications have 10, 15, 20 different third party libraries that have to keep up to date. Well, make sure to do that. Uh, then also be careful to implement in this logic, uh, uh, SSL pinning or certificate pinning or public key pinning. It's a very useful um, security measure that you can add to your apl application. But me be sure that you know how to implement that because a bad implementation of this logic could introduce this vulnerability where, you, where uh, someone can send you a, a fake certificate and you might end up accepting it. If you need to do it, um, uh, this is a very good library, Trustkit. Uh, they built it uh, and they used the proper uh, pinning, which is the, the public key info pinning is the one they use. They explain why, they explain how. So you can definitely use this in your projects if you wanna uh, implement uh, certificate pinning. And there's also more, more information and the OS project, uh, the open source web application project. Uh, it will give you more information about why this is a good idea, how to do it, uh, what's the best way to pin, what information to pin. Uh, so if you want to read more, just read about this. Uh, the fourth vulnerability. The, back to the first vulnerability that we saw, uh, is that this application is it's accepting arbitrary HTML code. But in this case, we're gonna pair that with a very dangerous um, 
uh, vulnerability from uh, an old iOS class, which is called UI WebView. As you can see in the documentation, even Apple says that be careful when you're using this class, specifically this method with this class, to access local uh, files. Um, and we, we're going to see why a little bit later. Uh, but it, as you can see from documentation, this, a, this class was deprecated in iOS 12, which was released last year. But there, I, I have not found one app that is not using this yet. Uh, so there are many, many apps that are still using a UI WebView. And the problem when they're using this uh, method, or actually before I, we go into that, uh, Apple suggests you to use this, this other method that is called uh, load, load HTML with a base URL. The problem is that what is not said in the documentation is that having a null or an empty base URL is the same as not having that. So these two API calls are equivalent. So as a not, don't use any of this. And the reason is because when you don't define a base URL for a web view, any JavaScript that is running uh, on that web view have access to any file within your file system, within your uh, sandbox of your application. So uh, all, all your documents, folders, all your temp folders, your cache folders are accessible by JavaScript executed on your web view if you don't define a base. So you're basically defining a scope for your JavaScript if you don't define a scope. It's like it's open game for any access to any file that you have within your binary, within your bundle. Um, so something like this could happen. Someone can write a payload that will search for, in this case, it searches for a, a database. Um, and during the static analysis, you can, you can find that an application saves a database for, let's say, your messaging apps, so your messages, for example, or your, uh, it's very common that your crypto wallet would just create a local database where it stores all the private keys for your cryptocurrency. So this is a very dangerous application to have loading um, a web view with no scope because JavaScript could just search for that um, uh, database and just send them remotely. So you just read that file from the local disk and just send it to a remote server, right? Um, this is how that payload looks when you encode it. That's not important. Uh, but here, I'm going to show how, how to do that. Like Again, the user is just surfing around, and then they're going to try to open uh, a link, and that's going to open a web view within the vulnerable application. And I'm not, I'm not going to show you sent, like the database being sent to a server because that, that's, that's kind of difficult to show. But here, we're able to read this database that is in the documents folder of your application. Uh, even though this is just a simple website, this is just a web view that is loaded, it has access to all their file system within your sandbox. Right? So how do we fix this? Don't use UI web view anymore. Uh, there's no need to use that. Uh, there's a, a new and better. Um, class that is called w WK WebView. Uh, it supports everything that the UI WebView supports, and it doesn't have the same vulnerabilities. It doesn't have the same uh, vulnerable APIs. If you, by, for some reason, you still need to use the UI WebView class, uh, maybe all or, uh, old versions or, or compatibility issues, don't use these two methods. Don't use the to, uh, load request for local access. And if you're using the, the base URL uh, method, make sure, if you don't know what's the base URL, you can use the strict where you just have uh, about column blank, which is a standard way on web to load a blank web page. Uh, and that will give the scope to your web view to just whatever is loaded within that web view. And, and that's all the resources that JavaScript can access. Uh, so some conclusions about this. Uh, add security assessments to your build cycles. Um, whenever, you, if you have like a QA cycle, for example, add security assessments to that. That's a very good idea. Have someone either internally or, or a third party uh, pen tester go through your app uh, or your apps, plural, and check, about, like, check some of these vulnerabilities. Uh, keep your third party uh, libraries uh, up to date. This is, uh, I know I've said this before, but yes, again, I've seen so many of these instances where uh, applications are vulnerable just because they have an old version of an of a third party library. Uh, be careful when you copy and paste data from just the internet, like Stack Overflow or something like that, because they might have vulnerable portions. 
uh, especially when you're implementing very complicated logic like uh, SSR, like SSL pinning and, and things like that, you, you need to make sure that that code works and it's not vulnerable. Um, lastly, and this is a very important one, have a public bug bounty. Like if, if you don't want to pay uh, researchers for, for finding vulnerabilities, that's fine. But at least have some way for someone to contact you. Uh, I, I moved from just working with uh, public bug bounties to just randomly download applications and searching for vulnerabilities. And there, there are many, many, many applications that are vulnerable, but there's no way to contact the vendor. There's no way to say, oh, hey, look, developers, can you just fix this, please? Uh, I'm not asking for money in return or anything. I just want you to fix this for your users. And I usually just find out a random like contact at website.com email or a contact form from their website that goes to, I don't know, sales, and they might not know how to react to someone saying, I find a vulnerability in your system or in your app. And they just might discard this email. So have some way so that anyone can contact you and give you this information because this is a struggle that we have in the community where we find vulnerabilities and we don't know how to reach out to people because sometimes they're like, we're threatened into, oh, we're going to sue you, we're going to send the police your way or something like that. Uh, whereas we're just trying to help the companies. So this is very important. And some of the resources that you can find, uh, so the OWASP program, uh, the project, uh, it was built for web, but now it has a mobile branch where you can find a lot of resources for how to securely build your, uh, your iOS or Android applications, how to pen test the applications yourself, how to start learning about all these things. And then uh, finally, I have my own version of this. So I created a, I call it a course, uh, um, but it's a bunch of write-ups about very common vulnerabilities. Uh, but it also takes you from not knowing how to decrypt an iOS app to all the way to modify that. And I, I did this because I, 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 f I found that there are many people that are interested into learning all this thing, but they don't know how to start. They don't know where to start. Um, so this will teach you all the way from selling all your tools, creating your environment, all the way to modifying your application or third-party applications at runtime. And it's free. It's there to use. It's open source. Um, I, I recently found that there's a professor that is using this course and some write-ups that I have for one of his courses. It was fantastic. This is exactly why I write this kind of stuff, so that more people will learn about it. And so back to the initial story. Uh, after that, uh, and they invited me to their private program to see their, um, their app before it would hit the market. Many, many, many other companies reach out and say, okay, can you please also look our, uh, to our apps? Because there are not many, uh, many researchers looking at the mobile apps, and many of them will offer to pay you double for the vulnerabilities if you find something on your mobile app. So yeah, if you're looking for doing something on the side, this is a very interesting uh, job to do. And with that, I'm gonna take some questions. Thank you, thank you. I think we have a time to have a discussion, right? To ask questions. And as as someone with microphone, I'll do first. <laughs> so Ivan, uh, we, which vulnerabilities have you found, like which are most popular? Um, the most popular one that I've seen is the hard-coded credentials. That's Hard-coded hard -coded credentials, hard -coded right, credentials. in the app, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And basically, you can you can get them just by like reverse engineering, just by uh, running the strings command for your app. Yeah, so you could go all the way from just a plain, simple plain text file, as I showed here, all the way to having an obfuscated string within the binary. Uh, that at the end of the day, uh, if I spend enough time, I will be able to um, reverse engineer that and figure that the values, and I'm gonna uh, we'll be able to use those to log in as the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, from my experience, the cryptographic keys, you know, when you have some encrypted data in right. your app, but you put a key somewhere in a playlist near the data. Great. Okay, thank you. So please raise your hand if you have a question. And we have a microphone here, right? Do we? Please, like, continue having your hand. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Hey, thank you. Great talk. 
Yeah. Um, you, you talked a little bit about certificate pinning and you do reverse engineering. So I'm, I'm curious, and, and so just a reminder for people, certificate pinning helps prevent man in the middle attacks on the TLS connection, for instance. Yep. So um, are you finding certificate pinning as a reverse engineer, are you finding it to be an impediment to figuring out the protocol or are you able to like take out the logic that checks the certificate or replace the logic that checks the certificate with your own certificate? Um, so yes to both questions. Um, I find it as, as an impediment it's because you usually just want to do the very initial uh, dynamic analysis where you just install your own certificate on your device and then you want to tra uh, sniff the traffic. Uh, so the first thing that it says, like, oh, I cannot see the traffic or it, it's blocking the connections, is like, oh, there's some certificate pins. So I have to f uh, fix this, right? I have to figure this out. So the second question, yes, uh, it's not trivial because some of them have very intricate logic around the pinning uh, and you have to break that uh, before you can sniff the traffic. So it, it's, it's a game where the more layers they have to your security, it will, it will benefit the company, uh, but someone with enough time and resources will eventually get there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great, please raise your hand. Yeah, here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about the differences in the protection offered by Apple's app transport security settings and certificate pinning? Like, what are the different attacks that you would be protected from under both? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, Apple or App Transport Security, uh, it's Apple's way to ensure that your application is connecting over TLS. So they have, uh, they enforce that every connection that your application is trying to make, uh, it, it has a TLS connection on it. Uh, and it has a, a well-defined set of accepted um, uh, cryptographic algorithms that you can use for that uh, TLS. So, you, for example, you cannot use TLS 1.0 or 1.1, for example, right? So it limits to the, uh, or it, it guides you towards what type of TLS connections you can have. Certificate pinning, it's an extra step to that where you will only accept the one or the two or the three certificates for your specific domain uh, within a TLS connection. So it's, it's, it's a step beyond what Apple is doing with ATP, ATS. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. I think it was very practical. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I am, as a, this is a question from an app user point of view rather than app developer point of view. I get really very scared when an app loads a web UI because I can't see the URL and even if I could see the URL, I can't see the certificate the URL is getting served from, right? This is a problem across all platforms, not just iOS, right? Uh, I'm just curious why industry has fallen so behind about this very important aspect because, you know, it's, it's a simple thing. A content being served from a some server which could do something to your device and there is just no way of knowing what, where that content is coming from. It seems like a big thing. Why are you on web view, web view allowed in general in the apps? Yeah, uh, well, I don't really have uh, an answer <laughs> for, for that, but my experience is that there are many companies that are doing this because of time. They cannot build something for both iOS and Android very quickly, or they might change their minds down the road. So they build a web view side of things because they can dynamically change that. They can change that on the server side. And if you're loading just a web view, it could look like anything. You could just change that page. You don't have to resubmit an app to either of the stores. And so it's about time and things like that. Uh, simplicity, those are the most common aspects I have seen for people using web views. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Please raise your hands. Do we have questions from this uh, side, this sector? Yes? Hey, thanks once again for the talk. Um, I do have a question about uh, uh, this process. Can we kind of automate it? I know LinkedIn created Quark a couple of years ago. Uh, that's for Android only. These specific things are for iOS. Is something like Quark available for iOS as well? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, there are not many services providing this automation. Uh, there are 
tools that will help you, but it's not an automated process in the entirety. Uh, there, like for example, I have scripts that will decrypt your app and transfer it to your computer on its own. But the actual analysis, that's a very hands-on thing. Um, uh, I, I think mainly because of the tiny ecosystem that Apple has that not many things will run on devices. Like I know there are automated um, tools that, that are companies, I know of companies that have this, but they're not publicly um, available to anyone to use the services. Uh, I know of, of two, at least two companies that they regularly download apps from like the top 100 apps or free apps or something like that, and they uh, have some static analysis on all of them, and they have like a, a farm of devices that are downloading, because you have to have a device to download uh, uh, an iOS app. So they have farms of devices where they download the applications they perform. All of them are jailbroken. So they have custom builds. They have custom scripts running on them. Um, but it's a proprietary. It's, it's not available for the public. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Please raise your hand. OK, yeah, I see a hand. Thank you. Hi, a great talk. Um, most apps uh, are using HTT uh, JSON HTTP based requests, yeah? So did you encounter any apps that used, for example, Protobuf? And is Protobuf making um, uh, reverse engineering any harder or many the middle attacks any harder? That's a great question. Um, yeah, most of them are using a REST API uh, or even a. Um, uh, GraphQL, but at the same time, it's 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 text, right? Probuf is more of an encoding of the actual data that we send, and yes, it kind of makes it harder. But there are tools like Burp. Uh, Burp it's a proxy application that you can use to sniff the traffic between. Uh, it's mostly built for web, but you can also use it for mobile applications. Uh, and they have a built-in parser for Protobus. So even if the traffic it's it's encoded uh, into a binary code. Uh, it will be able to just show you the plain text. So it's not that big of a deal. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, just curious, in your experience, if you've seen any more vulnerabilities with apps that are a result of coming from a cross-platform solution like React Native or Flutter or something like that? Good question. That's a very good question. Um, yes. Uh, well, the, the, the first thing to say about that is that it's easier to go through the source code. Because at the end of it, it's just JavaScript that is bundled uh, in the app. So it's not down to uh, machine code. It's JavaScript that you can read very, very well. So it's easier for a reverse engineer to check that bundle, to check that application. Uh, if you see the binary, uh, it just has very tiny code that loads a web view, and then everything goes to the JavaScript. Uh, so in that sense, it's the, the entry barrier is easier for anyone reverse engineering that type of app. Second, um, some of the developers uh, don't realize that it's, it's like that is a plain text JavaScript, but it's going to end up in their application. So they hard code a lot of uh, credentials in those type of apps. Um, so that's uh, including to your first question was that, uh, what are, what's the mo most common one? That is part of that. The, the hard-coded credentials within JavaScript code, that's very common. The second, it's um, cross-site scripting uh, vulnerabilities where you're allowed, as we saw the last one, is a cross-site scripting vulnerability where you're allowed to execute code or access data from a different domain than your web view. Um, these types of, uh, of frameworks would allow you to do that because at the end of the day, they cannot restrict to just one web view. They have to restrict you everything within your application bundle. So you can see some cross app scripting and vulnerabilities introduced because of that. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Do we have it? Three, two, one. So, okay, I have a question. Ivan, how long did it usually take you to reverse engineer these applications? I know that it's like an endless journey, but do you have some like timing in mind? Um, it, it depends on the functionality. Like, for example, I'm very interested in crypto wallet applications. Uh, that's, uh, most of the, the applications that I've done in the past two or three months are crypto wallet kind of applications. And they're kind of simple because most of the logic is within the application. But at the same time, 
you have to understand what are, what are the um, cryptography parts that they're using and all the logic that they're using to protect the crypto coins and things like that. Um, so it can take a week to figure out an, like perfectly an application, but also part of, uh, of my research, it's around um, uh, applications that are like spying on users, for example, and that will take like a month or two. But when you say week or months, it's not like a full-time job? Yeah, no, I do this on a side. So it's like I have my five to, uh, nine to five job and then I go back home and then just do this. So software developer during day, hacker during night. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you a lot.